Welcome to the podcast, Guidance with Gab, learn and unlearn all things wellness. Today we have Nicole Rogers, a former Rockette, but over the past 10 years renewed her life to become a spiritual teacher and empowerment transformation coach. With her focus on the significance of numbers in life, she is the author of the book, 13, One Woman's Sacred Journey to Discovering Her Greatest Power. So welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Gabby. Of course. I wanted to start with this because it was, I'm I'm reading all about the numbers and the significance and I go on your Instagram and you had 999 followers and I click on it and then I'm the thousandth follower. And I'm like, okay, I'm doing a podcast with someone who's all about numbers and I see 999. Okay, this is, this is a sign. So I thought that was crazy. Wow. Oh my God. Thank you so much for being my thousandth follower. You're welcome. (laughs) Do you, do you know what 999 signifies by any chance or? No, but nine is such a powerful number. I mean, in, in Qigong and Tai Chi, like every nine is like seen as the completion. So whenever you are taught uh, a series of movements, They will Mm -hmm. always say like for your best well-being, they recommend you do something nine times. So Mm -hmm. to have three nines and three is the number of sacred union that I'm like, wow, it doesn't, it doesn't get more than that. (laughs) Okay. Wow. That was crazy. I ran to my mom. I'm like, you need to see this. There's no way as I'm doing my research on you, seeing all the stuff about numbers, I go on your page 999. All right, this is this is meant to be. And you're also the first guest of my season four podcast. I took a long break and every time I fall out of it for a bit, I've been traveling and I moved. So there's been a lot going on. There's always something that brings me back. And this felt like the mark of, okay, you are meant to be, you, you are meant to do this. So it, it was like a, a two-sided thing there. I'm like, I'm her thousandth follower and she is still giving me something by giving me that like divine confirmation that this is meant to be. So thank you. <laughs> I was so excited for this conversation. Yeah, yeah. Wow. The stars aligning. They're doing I job. know I can like feel it like all around me. I'm like, oh, this is yeah i was actually really cold before now i'm getting warm and i don't it's not like a nervous thing it's like a when i get excited or like a little connected i'm like all right they're here (laughs) the divine is here i love it i love it though um so of course we can't gloss over that you are a rock pet so i was wondering if you were into like the spiritual world as a rock pet or if you had just that one moment that was like oh, my life has changed forever now and I'm diving into the spiritual world. Yeah, so my journey is that I was raised in a Methodist household and I was raised, um, my mother very, very strong in her faith with God and uh, my mother was also a handbell director. Do you know what handbells are? Have you ever seen Mm -hmm. handbells before? Have you ever seen like people, like they hold them in their hands and it's like a single bell and each bell is a single tone. And so when you okay. snap your wrist, then yeah. the clapper hits up against the inside. And so yeah, yeah. it's very common within um, churches to have these handbell choirs. Mm-hmm. So my mom's this brilliant, br- brilliant handbell director. And I grew up in her choirs and learning it. And so there was there was a lot because like... There was the faith piece and then there was the fun piece. There was the social piece. So, you know, as a child, it was like, Jesus is great. Faith is great. Religion is wonderful. All this yeah. stuff. And then what happened was I found myself really getting into theater mm-hmm. and I was doing choir and dance and deciding that I wanted to go into theater as my profession. Mm-hmm. And I started having gay friends and I was like, wait a minute. I was taught some really messed up things and none of it's true. And so as I went into my twenties, there was just this giant questioning that was going on. And my, and this is really a a reflection of where I was in my emotional maturity was that instead of trying to really gain understanding about it, I just exited. 
And mm -hmm. I just made like very bold decisions that um, this was wrong and this was bad and I just need to leave when, you know, now I can look at it and say that it was dogma, that what was happening was more about organized dogma, very patriarchal things that we all know have been passed down that are not helpful, right? Like this was mm -hmm. never the intention of faith was to pit yep. people against each other. Yeah. But I didn't have that kind of clarity and I certainly wasn't seeking someone to teach that to me. You know, it was much more like, well, I know, so I'm just going to leave. And so what's interesting is that as I went into my first career with Trisa as a performer, I didn't really have faith. I didn't really have the sacred with me to help me ground and understand the incredible roller coaster, the a massive amount of rejection and the huge focus on the external, right? Mm -hmm. Like especially as a rock cat, wow, right? I can't imagine. Can't Hair's imagine. gotta be perfect, makeup, yep. and like, like literally, I can remember being in tech the first time I was a rock cat and we were doing this number holding candy canes. And I'll never forget this. We were all supposed to freeze. And the, the dance captain's out there with the God mic. And she's like, Nicole, move your candy cane down an inch. Hmm. So I was like, and she goes, make sure every time you bring it back to that place. Oh I'm my like, goodness. You know what I mean? So there was, yeah. I was getting so much of this reinforcement yeah of perfection of the external of all these things and i didn't have the balance mm -hmm. because i kind of shut the door on it so when i went through my 13 which is what the book is about where mm -hmm. my life burned to the ground i found myself on my knees crying out to god for the first time but i had <laughs> lost all connection with yeah. the divine and the sacred so it was quite i mean an amazing storm that brought me back to faith. And for me, that journey started with Zen. Mm -hmm. So I've been on that path for 10 years and now I have a much greater understanding of, I think what Christianity is probably like the, the core roots were and, and mm -hmm. what it was meant to be teaching as opposed to what I misunderstood or yeah. what was taught to me in very patriarchal ways. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I've, I've come back to faith through the lens of Buddhism and it's been such a gift because then as I've rebuilt my life, I've had faith again. Yeah. Oh, that's such a beautiful story, the, the circle that it's created. And I think so many people find themselves in that position of not having faith and then you're in such a heartbreaking moment and you think i don't feel it within myself i can't ask anyone around me i i'm asking god i'm asking universe i'm asking this power outside of me so i think so many people experience what you did with i i don't know who to ask for i don't know where to go so i'm going to go to this deity this thing that i i might not even be connected to but it it feels safe um and I also think it's interesting how, you know, Christianity and a lot of different religions, I, I personally believe all have roots in, you know, good intention. I don't think that yeah. any of them are meant to preach things like gay people are bad and, you know, certain religions are bad. I think they're all rooted in love and acceptance and compassion and have just been translated in their own ways. So I think it was interesting that you touched on that because that's something that always gets me a little flustered. You know, it's it's a topic that really gets to me because I do know that however many years ago when these religions were all created, it had to be out of good intention. And just from their own perspective, they weren't meant to pin people against each other. Um, so I just really like that you mentioned that. I also want to talk about your 13th because... I have a weird parallel and I call it a turkey. So with my friend Henry, we were in the same, I think, physics class together. And physics is not my thing. It was about like velocity and the teacher was very boring and talking about a turkey hitting a window at a velocity. 
whatever. And from then on, we were just like, that is the weirdest analogy or like problem that he gave us to solve. Why is the turkey hitting a window? So now with Henry, every time we have just things thrown at us in life, we say, I go, Henry, I'm, I'm getting hit with turkeys right now. And he'll come to me and say, I just got hit with a turkey. And we laugh because we know it's silly, but we both know what it means. It's like something probably a little big and that is dreadful and is knocking us down. That's our turkey. And I think that it's similar to your 13. So I kind of wanted to ask you, is it similar? And what, what is a 13 to you? Yeah, so it definitely probably feels like something large going at a very high speed, hitting up against something painful. Yep. <laughs> but what a 13 is, is actually a divine storm. So that means it's a sacred opportunity for transformation. Mm -hmm. And this is what allows it to be a refuge as opposed to uh, plunging you further into victim consciousness mm. or something that is disempowering in the moment. Because when we're in pain, man, like you said, where do I turn to? What is going to give me comfort that is actually going to give me comfort as opposed to just putting it under the rug or making toxic choices? And so mm. I it was really wanted the message of 13 to be this idea that we all go through 13s probably multiple times in our life, but that it is always going to be a crossroads moment. And that if we can seek it that way and say, wait, I could do the same thing. I could make the choice of this happens to me all the time. Um, this is just how it is. I mean, I'm sure you've heard yourself say that. I really I used to say this before I went through my 13, but it's like, but wait a minute, what if this is an opportunity for me to transform my life? So what if what I am losing and burning down is going to create a fertile soil for me to create what I want? What if the 13 is actually focusing me more on what's most important? You know, for me, a big part of that first 13 was about creating a family. Yeah. And it was so apparent that my first husband didn't want to be a father. He didn't want to create that with me. And I had been doing all I could to make it work, mm -hmm. to be the cheerleader, you know, all of these things. And meanwhile, I wasn't getting pregnant. And my body was wise. My body was so wise. It was like, no, 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 not with this guy. Mm -hmm. So out of this, immense loss really brought me to such a focus that I was like, okay, if this is what I want, then I'm going to put my best energy in it and I'm going to ask for guidance. I'm going to ask for help. And it came. And I think there was something, the faith came so quickly because I noticed that when I finally came to such a place of surrender and I need help and I need help in a sacred way that all these new teachers started coming into my life, support started coming into my life. Friends were giving me keys to their apartment. I was like, oh, I'm being aided. You know, I'm being mm -hmm. aided. Like the universe isn't like, no, 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 you don't want to go this way. It's like, no, no, you want to go this way. No, yeah. no, this is all going to burn down very quickly because the amount mm -hmm. of change that happened in 13 months is dizzying. Even to myself now, I'm like, whoa, how did I survive that? Yeah. Um, but I was aided. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so yeah. I think that's, that's, if we can view these very challenging moments in that way, I think it just helps us. It helps us to reconnect back to our life. Yeah, yeah. And our energy and where we're placing it, at knowing that it's challenging, knowing that there is grief, and, and certainly knowing that we are, we are feeling enormous emotions and we're being challenged in ways we never knew we could be challenged. And yet, if we can use these tools and view it that way, then we can emerge stronger on the other end and actually create what we want. Yeah. 
you have such a, a beautiful way of looking at it because there are the two options when we're hit with a challenge. And in in such you know simple terms, it's sink or swim, but that's not really how in a way it is. But on the other side, it's are we gonna sink ourselves? You know, are we gonna keep going into it? Are we gonna be the victim, like you said? Are we gonna keep that same train of thought of this always happens to me? Why do I have this? Why is this happening to me? And then there's the flip side of oh, why did this happen for me? And not not in this deep questioning of pain, but, oh, curiosity. Let me see. Let me go into that. Why is this door closing for me? And what else is going to come out of it? Because I, what you said in your story, I feel like is so true on so many levels of when you leave a certain situation that wasn't meant for you and you you close that door, all the other doors, the universe is like, okay, go, 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 go. Because for so long you were stuck in this box of, I, I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do. And then the universe sees you take that powerful step. And it's like you open up in so many different ways. And the universe is going to support that kind of behavior when it sees you doing something that's meant for you. The universe has your back all the way. It's going to support you. Like you said, you know, doors literally open for you, which I just think is, it, you have such a beautiful story and it's very powerful to both hear and read because again, I've, I've read it and it, I'm sitting there like diving into the book. I am sucked into the story because one, you were so vulnerable, which I want to get to later, but just reading everything that like was happening in your life was just, yeah, really intense. And you're able to now look back with clear eyes. But I wanted to ask if that clarity was present while you were enduring it, or did it only come after the 13 months? Yeah, great question. So I, in the book, wanted to make sure that the woman that was going through it was there. So mm -hmm. the journal entries in the book are my journal entries. The mm -hmm. dream journal that like the dreams I had, I wrote at that time. So she's in there. And when you listen to her, I mean, even when I wrote the book, which is eight years later, I was like, oh, oh no, she knew. So that's what I, to answer your question, yes. But the book was written eight years later and I wrote this um, really beautiful guest piece for a uh, booksbywoman.org and i got to kind of break down my process about how i felt like the book was this convergence of the woman in 2013 and then the woman in 2021 who wrote it who mm -hmm. had eight years of wisdom and had been through a few more other 13s after that to be honest yeah. with you um and and how they kind of came together to create the story so there was wisdom that came after but as far as during it i mean it was sure that your listeners can understand and you can understand that when we start having those like big aha moments those big like oh my god like that's what was happening for me over and over again with all these things falling apart and yet all of these things coming to me all the support coming to me and finding zen was mind-blowing like in mm -hmm. the best way because i realized that i had always been seeking tools around my mind yep. tools around my critic tools around all of these ways that i had hit a ceiling within my performance career and i, I didn't know what do i do with this what do i do and here it was like here you go mm -hmm. here you go and so to come out of that and be like wow and then to notice such a difference in myself yeah. When I did return to the stage and then wanting to open my own business and and use my experience as teaching for the world, it just was like, oh, wow. Yeah. So yeah. I'm a mix to answer your question. A mix. Yeah, yeah. I can definitely see that. I mean, especially looking back, that must have been such an emotional journey for you also. Like you're reading one of the most painful experiences of your life from your own perspective. And that's heavy enough knowing that that version of you did endure all of that. 
Um, and I wanted to just kind of talk about the vulnerability that you show in the book because not everyone can do that. Not everyone can. I, I'm reading what you were writing and I'm thinking that is something I would feel, but I, I'm also very vulnerable, but I'm like, some people could never write that and publish it for other people to read. Like I just understood you so much deeper because of the vulnerability and the honesty. Not everyone is saying what you said in that book. No one, a lot of people wouldn't want that published because of how that might impact their image or just putting that information out there. And it, it made the story complete because you can relate. It's what we all really feel. So how did you make that decision to say, I am gonna include these really real and raw things that I was thinking and feeling? Yeah, great question. So I've worked with a, a lot of writers as clients. And what I say to all of them is you decide. Mm -hmm. You decide what you share. And you decide by two things. One, you're on the other side of it. Mm, yeah. You're not in the muck. You're on the other side of it. And two, you feel safe. Mm. If those two things are not present, don't do it. You're not, and you may never, and that's okay. Yeah. But if you can use these as guidelines, it ends up being a great way to look at all content. Yeah. You know, not just if you're writing a book, but your newsletters, your social media, to really just check in and be like, am I on the other side of this? Meaning I've gained the wisdom from the disappointment and from the pain. And two, do I feel safe? Mm -hmm. So for me, and I talk about this in the book, I went to my first ever support group and this was in March of 2013. So, you know, the, the I was in mediation was done waiting on divorce papers. I mean, it was like a, a tsunami and I went to the support group. I'd never been to one before. It's called the healing circle and it was at the Shambhala center. So at this time I hadn't found Zen yet and I was trying out different forms of Buddhism. And so I went to try the Tibetan form and uh, at this support group, I did something I'd never done publicly, which was to be completely honest mm. and share vulnerably what I was going through. And when I did that, I found that people came close. And not only that, but that it opened up the space for each person after me in the circle to share more of themselves. Mm -hmm. And so after at this point, a career of you know 19 years in the business yeah. and being taught and being told and believing that I had to have it all together, I had to put on an act, blah, blah, blah. I realized that I'd been wrong. And so it was one of those moments of, like it switched. Yeah. And once the switch happened, it was done. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't going to go yeah. back. Like it was like, oh, it's like I've seen the truth. Yeah. That yeah. was a lie what I was living before. This is actually the truth. Look, this is how you create connection. Yeah. You do it this way. So after that, then I just kept doing it and I kept having the same results. And mm -hmm. I kept seeing again and again how people like you they softened and they opened and then they felt that they could do the same. And I've seen mm -hmm. it with my clients. So it's really my own experience and then proof of concept shown over and over again in my clients having these same kind of results for those that are in a space where they are on the other side of it and they feel safe. <laughs> yeah. I love those two, uh, those two rules or guidelines that you have, because it, it could go one of two ways. Also with the, I've heard people on podcasts, they like, they might not be over something and then they go talk about it. And then they're dealing with more issues almost. I don't want to say issues. They can't think of the right word, but more conflict within when they're expressing and talking about something that they haven't even dealt with themselves and now they're kind of like trauma dumping onto other people and it creates this weird mesh of unprocessed emotions which can be really hard so i oh think it's, it is really important to process it yourself and then share because people are so drawn to comfortability vulnerability if you even if people don't you know feel energy in the sense that maybe you and i and 
you know, other people do, you can still feel energy in a room. Anyone can walk into a room or have a conversation with someone and feel where the energy is at. And you have one person there that's huh, soft and comfortable and inviting, then, oh, I'm going to be soft and comfortable and inviting. And then that creates a whole circle of people that are all, okay, wait, we are safe. We're good. You need one person to start. And then everyone else kind of kind of reaches that level. But I think that it's great that you were the person that said, no, I am going to be vulnerable, especially given your rocket past of the perfectionism and the image and showing up a certain way. That must have been really uh, challenging. And I think that that's a great hurdle to get over. Some people can be stuck there for a long time. And that's a really difficult place to be in perfectionism. Um, I wanted to talk to you a bit about breakups and like heartbreak because I think everyone can learn a little bit about that. And I was just wondering what advice you have for anyone going through a really hard heartbreak. Yeah. Oh man. And for anyone that's listening right now and they're going through it, I like, I'm sending so much love through the screen, through the airwaves, because I get this so much, um, mm -hmm. because it's important to know that regardless of the fact that <clears throat> this man wasn't going to be the father of my children or, you know, that we were both having affairs, any of these things that you could get very like heady about and logical about. Yeah. I was devastated. I, I loved my first husband, you know, so there was just to, I think it's really important to hold such respect for mm -hmm. feeling the feelings as you love to tell your audience. Yeah, yeah. But what I would say is, I was talking about this on another podcast, the importance of grief mm. and our culture, especially our Western culture, doesn't have respect for grief. You know, it's probably the most common thing that people are saying or not saying, but they're saying it, which is kind of like, are you over it yet? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. Or are you done? Mm -hmm. You know, and grief has its own timeline. And since my 13 and going through my divorce, I, I went through some huge grieving with creating my family, I failed IVF, miscarriage, an adoption falling through. I mean, I'll tell you with, with the miscarriage, I, I would think I was okay. And it would be weeks and I'd be like, wow, I, I feel like the process has been the process. And then I'd find myself in the grocery store looking at a baby and mm -hmm. having to leave the grocery store. Like yeah. so, oh, it would just overwhelm me. So I feel like the first loving invitation I would give or just normalization is that grief has its own timeline and to, and to have a, a sacredness for the process. And the best way you can do that is bring as much compassion as possible that you have tools that are saying, I allow this, you know, even though I feel devastated, I love and accept myself, you know, whatever self-regulation tools you have that are just super compassionate and loving mm -hmm. <laughs> around your grieving. And then the other piece is support. And I would say safe support. Mm -hmm. So, yep. so important when you're going through a breakup that you surround yourself with safe support right people that aren't going to be projecting their stuff on you people that aren't going to be expecting you to show up in this like big way when you're just not there mm -hmm. but that are going to be listening to you be empathetic and and have awareness around themselves you know and if if it's appropriate then groups you mm -hmm. know circles therapy healers coaches but that they are safe spaces meaning that they allow you to be you they're not rushing you but they are listening to you and perhaps offering new perspectives and asking questions that again are for your well-being yeah they're not to change you but they're really like inviting you into what is so tender in your heart right now and what is it leading you to that's going to be helpful mm -hmm. that is such 
such good advice. I went through a breakup. I was 22, I don't know, 20, yeah, 22. So of course, nothing as dramatic as something like, you know, 19 years of marriage or anything. But for me in the moment, it was like, oh my God, this is painful. And I've always felt like my friends are my family. And in those times, I had never been more grateful for the support system that I had. I remember I went to my one friend's house because I didn't want to be like just home. It was during COVID. I didn't want to be home with like my mom just crying. So I would go to my friend's house and I was like, can I just come over and cry for like the whole day? She's like, yeah, come on over. And I would go to her house. She'd just be doing her own thing. But it was just having a space to like delete pictures, cry, feel, maybe do some arts and crafts with her, but having a space to do that. And then you know, I'd be on my drive home. I'm like, okay, I feel okay. And then I'd park my car. And I'm like, oh my God, I can't. I'd call my other friend and say, I just need to cry. I just need someone to listen to me cry. And everyone just showed up in such an accepting, loving way. And there was never a, seriously, a, we are still talking about it. We're still talking about it. I never felt that. It was always, oh gosh, I'm, I'm here to listen. And that was just such a blessing for me. So I always say my biggest tip in any sort of heartbreak is feel the feelings and talk to people. <laughs> the safe space is like, if you don't feel safe being alone because the feelings might get too much or the thoughts are too much, like just even be in the same space as someone. You don't have to take up their whole day and hang out and go do these things, but just have, have that other energy with you to kind of take your mind off of it. And something else you met, um, mentioned was grief. Mm -hmm. And I think that's interesting given the past few months of my life, I've been really focusing on grieving things that aren't typically in that box. Like I'm not grieving a person necessarily, but grieving experiences. I'm grieving my past self. I'm grieving the person who made certain decisions. I'm grieving the person who went on a whole excursion the past year and moved here. I'm grieving so many parts of me. I'm grieving places that I went to that I don't, I don't live there anymore. And I have to grieve all of those things. And I think back, I'm big into inner child work and I'm thinking of all the things in my childhood that maybe I just didn't grieve. I, I just had to say, oh, okay, it's done. Let's put it in a box and let's keep going. Because like you said, Western culture is very boom, onto the next. And I've been really diving into like grief and going backwards and noticing, hmm, what feels unprocessed that I now need to grieve? And it's been really helpful because I'm actually finding closure and closing doors and it's creating space for all these other things to, to flow when before it was trying to just build on top of a messy Jenga house with like, you know, the one stick there and we're trying to build and just a bunch of holes because everything's unprocessed and there's open doors everywhere and confusion now it feels more safe, closed. Okay, we move on. And that's been really nice. Yeah, so I really appreciate you sharing that because that we have to understand that grief is part of the healing. Like yeah. I think again, the culture will be like, well, that's over here and healing's over here. And it's like, no, no, it is the healing. Yeah. Like what is happening alchemically in our beings, in our spirit is healing in the grief. I mean, what's happening in the tears, what's happening in the expression, what's happening in the reflection is healing. Yeah. So, you know, again, it's like if we can be holding it in this viewpoint it opens up so much and again it allows because that space that we feel afterwards okay new things can come in but like you said we'll know that something is still in our body because we're trying to build and it's not working mm -hmm. yeah so something still needs to move and it's coming up anyway it's coming up in some way right in our bodies in our in our in our spirit it's that thing that keeps showing up, you know, whether it's like a headache or something like that to be like, something's still 
is calling to be loved. Something is still calling to be processed. So what can I learn? Mm -hmm. How can I learn to move this and make space? Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm all about noticing what is manifesting in my body. If I feel any type of symptom, I'm like, but what is the emotional side of it? That's like where I go first now, instead of directly going to the physical, I'm like, but, but what does this mean? What is this showing me in this life? Because it's not just, oh, I have a headache. It's like, hmm, what, what is deeper? What's beyond it? So that's always really interesting. Um, you live such a spiritual life now and you have so many cool, fun, spiritual experiences um, that you talk about in the book. I just read about um, your friend, Kathy, which I really enjoyed and reading that whole experience. But I wanted to know what are two important spiritual lessons that you believe people need to transform their lives? Yeah. So I would say these are the two things that were my pattern interrupt, kind of my like, whoa, you know, mm -hmm. kind of like what happened um, in the support group. And the first teaching was that we are whole. Mm. We are whole. And we were born whole. And no matter what we've lived, no matter what has been in our past, it doesn't change our wholeness. So in Buddhism, they say you have a Buddha within. You could mm -hmm. think of this as a God within, or you could think of a divine within, um, a deity within, whatever fits within your belief system. But it is that nothing is excluded. So it's this important idea that the headache, <laughs> the grief, mm -hmm. the happiness, the ecstasy, all belong. Nothing is evil, nothing is wrong. There's no problem. And so if we can view everything that's alive, our sensations, our feelings as part of a whole and that we are whole, we're not broken, it changes so much because then we're not beating ourselves up all the time. There isn't so much self-attack. And instead we can come into, okay, this is happening, like you said, why? What is occurring? What, what was that moment before? And so that is so important because again, this was, you know, a toxic, uh, a toxic turning on the Christian teaching, right? Is that I believed I was a sinner. Yeah. yeah. That I had to be saved. And so when I learned that I was whole, that was like, oh, wait a minute. I don't, oh, wait, I wasn't born evil. Mm -hmm. I was born whole. Oh, you're know, like, Thank goodness, right? right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Surprise. Surprise. So that's the first thing. And the second teaching is that change is constant. Mm. So this was really helpful for me when I was going through everything because I thought, okay, change is constant. Then it means I'm capable of changing. It means that even though I am devastated, even though I am experiencing oh my gosh, heartbreak and car accidents and robbery and, and losing a dear friend, that change is constant. So it's there's gonna be a period and then it's gonna change. Mm. And so this was really helpful and just like giving me some hope in the midst of so much chaos to know that the chaos wasn't permanent. Yeah. And the state that I was in wasn't permanent because change is constant. So I, I think that that's really important. And I would say on a deeper level, because I feel like I can say this with your audience, that if we can really take into account that change is constant, we will allow changes within ourselves. Mm, yeah. Right. From happy to sad, to up to down, to in between, to maybe feeling disconnected, to be like, no, but this is okay. Yeah. I don't have to be a certain way all the time. Mm -hmm. I love that. That is just the the perfect alignment with my message all the time. We don't, we're going to change. It's going to happen. We have to accept it. And that's, that's really it. And what you said about change, I think really connects back to the grief as well, because when we are constantly changing, we can't just let the change pass us by. We have to go through them also. So there is going to be the processing, which includes grief and 
processing the changes and saying, hey, that is okay that it changed. It doesn't have to be how it was. And maybe if we let go of the attachment to how things were, we will open up the possibilities to everything that can be. Because they might be better. They might be different. But they might be better. And if we keep that attachment to, you know, not wanting to change, then we're setting ourselves up for a little bit of failure there and closing ourselves off to the possibilities that we have. Those are two uh, two lessons that I'm definitely going to remind myself of for well, sure. And I'll put this as a caveat at the end is that, you know, for your audience as they're listening to find the tool that works for you, that helps you. Mm -hmm. with change because it will yep. be different for everybody, but you'll know that something works because you feel better after, because again, Western culture teaches us that things are fixed, you know, mm -hmm. that they have to be a certain way that we have to be a certain way. And so it really is like whatever those self-regulation tools are, whatever those spiritual tools are, breath work, yoga, meditation, there's energy medicine. There's so much out there now but to be really finding those tools that help you that as change is happening and that that part, our ego and that part of our body is just like, no, 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 change is scary, change is scary, that it's like, okay, how can I meet my fear mm -hmm. with tools that help me to process it? Yeah. Because that will help you come into more acceptance if you have a practice that allows you to be like, okay, here it comes. And I know it's because I want things to be certain. I want things to be safe. We all do. What is going to help me in this moment of change? Yeah, you put that so simply. If it works for you and it feels good and it seems like it's helping, then it's for you. I always say there's no should or could. Like it's just, it's what it is. And again, with the culture, there's so many, you, we should be doing this. You could be doing that. I should, I should. And there's so much around it. Even if for some people, breath work, just, it might not hit the same as it does for me. And that's fine. That's okay. You, you shouldn't feel like you have to do it or, oh, I'm going to go do this thing, even though it doesn't make me feel better because that's what all of these people online are saying. No, it's really as simple as you said, just find what you think is helping you. If it feels good, it helps. Okay. Perfect. But you don't have to you know, do all the things, find your thing and just let it be yours. There's no should or could. So that was, oh, I love it. You just have so much good, good little tips inside. You are awesome. Thank you. Can I, can I, I just add one last thing to that? Last yeah, thing? you can add as much as you want. <laughs> Which is that you feel better after. Yeah. Yeah. Not necessarily during, mm -hmm. but after. And I'll go in deeper to say it will feel like a kind of like like a release of energy as opposed to like a heaviness. If you try a process and you feel a real heaviness afterwards, it's not complete. Mm -hmm. And I think this is so important because a lot I know I have done a lot of self attack when I've tried something that is proven and you know, everybody says this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. And I find myself maybe having a headache or I find myself like feeling bad afterwards. I'm like, oh, maybe I just need to try it again. No, mm -hmm. it, the, the process wasn't complete because I have worked with some very amazing teachers where they took me through something and, and I couldn't believe it. But at the end of it, I'm literally dancing around my kitchen. Mm -hmm. And That's I'm like, yeah. oh, oh, so it's really important for your listeners to know as they are finding their teachers, as they are finding their mentors, and as they're trying things to be like after, not necessarily during, but that you feel like something has moved. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. so, like we talk about, we've had a good cry. Don't you feel better after a good cry? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Maybe some people do, but like, yeah, it, you're looking for that like whoa, relief, relief. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Crying is a great example versus like if we're using dancing or chanting or breathwork, but something as simple as crying, it 
probably doesn't feel the best while you're doing it. Yeah. You know, you're probably just, you know, you got the snot, you got the tears, you got your, you're trying to breathe. You're just a mess. But after, and, and that could be applied to any healing modality that you are entering. I think about certain yoga poses where I'm like, get me the F out of this right now. And I'm a yoga instructor. I'm like, get me out. And then after I'm like, oh, I am a thousand pounds lighter. But crying is so, so easy to use is like, yeah, it, it kind of sucks when you're doing it, but after you do feel that release. So yeah, that was great. Um, and this is a question I ask all my guests at the end of the podcast, which is if you were standing on a stage in front of the entire world and you, they're all listening, they're all paying attention. What would you say? And you could take a second. That one's always a little heavy. Oh man, I would probably look everyone in the eye and just say, you can. Like that, that thing that pulls at your heart, that desire that is alive in your belly, you can. You can create it. And I don't mean like what you think you should do or what somebody put on you for the purpose of your life, but the thing that is so alive in you that lights you up, that brings you such joy, you can. Mm, that gave me chills. I felt almost like you were talking to me. <laughs> I was like, wow, I felt personal. That was, that was so so beautiful you have like such a softness in your energy when you're carrying such um really good information like powerful information you have such a, a softness that comes with it which is just amazing you've been so great and where can the listeners find you where can they find your book all the good stuff yeah so they can find the book at 13thebook.com so that's one three t-h-e-b-o-o-k.com the nice thing about 13 is that it's literally everywhere. It's mm -hmm. at Amazon, Goodreads, Barnes and Noble. Um, one of my readers told me it's actually on thrift books. Uh, it's literally everywhere. And the nice thing too is that it comes in paperback, it comes in uh, Kindle, and it also comes in audiobook. So whatever oh, wow. way that you like to consume your content, it's there. And I really wanted to make sure because I had so many people come to me be like, you have to do this in audiobook. I don't read books. <laughs> I'm like, okay, cool. I'll do that. Um, and then they can find me on Instagram at Nicole underscore Rogers. And yes, my name is spelled super funky. And I K O L underscore R O G E R S. Please come. Instagram is like my main place. I hang out. DM me, say, hey, I heard you on Guidance with Gab, come and, and, and so I would love to know and please feel free to reach out with any questions there. And also my website is NicoleRogers.com. Oh, yay. I'm sure people are going to be very interested in everything you said. And from someone who is currently reading the book, if you're listening right now, you are in for a vulnerable ride and it is an amazing book. Honestly, it is written from your heart. This isn't a book written from your mind. It is just an outpouring of your soul. You feel the, the spirit coming through and your wisdom and your journey and the rawness and everything that came with your experience. So I would recommend this book to anyone and everyone. So thank I'm so you. thankful to have you on and to have this chat with you. So thank you so much. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for having me. Mm -hmm. I am so honored.